Right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Greeno. I work in the School of Social Work and Social Policy um, at the University of Strathclyde, um, which is in itself part of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences there. Uh, this is a big week for us. In fact, one of two very big weeks for us. Um, Strathclyde has been hosting the Conference of Youth, um, which um, preceded and slightly overlapped with the, 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 the COP26 event that's taking place also in Glasgow. Um, for those of you that don't know Strathclyde, it's located right in the city centre of Glasgow. So this is, this is a big thing for us. Um, we're hosting a whole range of events at the university over these couple of weeks um, because we want to celebrate and participate in COP26 as well. So please have a look at the university's website and see if there are any other events which might be interesting to you as well. Um, I am a professor of social policy, and it's my job, if you like, to try and link up things uh, and to think about how political and social factors interact with the major issues that we're facing at the moment. And it seems to me that there's a fairly compelling case for making an argument around this in relation to the environment. Um, that is very much the topic that I'm going to take you through today. Um, in outline, what I'm going to be looking at, if you like, is a social science perspective on the preconditions for successful policy change, especially in relation to the environment. So the data I'm going to be using actually is environmental data and looks for patterns of political and social factors which countries which are labelled as high performing seem to have in common. Um, I'm going to then spend some time talking about the, what those key causal factors might be, uh, talk a little bit about the method that I use to try and make sense of all of this data, and then some time, spend some time talking about the results, and hopefully I can communicate those. There's, there's a little bit of technical presentation, but I'll do my best to make this as clear as possible what's actually going on there, and then give you um, the, the conclusion of what I think the data appears to be saying. Okay, so that's the broad structure of what we're going to do, so I shall press on and get on with it then. Right, okay, so... What does it mean to take a social science perspective on the pre preconditions of policy change? Um, well, clearly, um, and I think this has been the main emphasis of a range of the university events, as well as a lot of the discussions that are taking place around COP, is that all of our scientific ingenuity is going to be needed in order to be able to do deal with the very challenging circumstances we find ourselves in and the technological um, um, uh, challenges that, that, that those raise. Um, looking at the situation, we're clearly going to need to um, change our lifestyles to a massive extent if we're going to keep the, the, the raise in um, temperatures, which um, go back to pre-industrial age below two degrees, if, it's, if that's even possible now. And certainly thinking about the, the, that in relation to energy, thinking about that in relation to um, technological change is going to be hugely important. However, these, aspect, these, these elements clearly have social and political aspects as well. Um, I, I think certainly if you look at the way that COP is being presented in the general media, that becomes extremely clear. COP is a pol political process as well. And it's also, I think, clear that some countries have made more progress towards the climate change targets that, that are out there already than others. And it's interesting to think whether there are, if you like, political preconditions and social preconditions for successfully engaging in the very significant changes that we've seen, especially in relation to the environment. Uh, the cartoon I've got now has almost become mimetic. There's hundreds of versions of this on the internet. Of course, we are all focused on COVID at the moment. Um, if you speak to people beyond COVID, they worry about the recession. Um, and, but in the wave behind that, we have climate change. This is something which I... Uh, I, the climate change scientists that I speak to tell me this is 99.9% settled in the science, um, that this is happening, that this is a result of human action, and we need to do something about it. Um, and, and of course, all of the technology and all of the um, changes we're seeing in the wider world are important within that. But in order for us to be able to move forward, we need to think about politics and we need to think about the social consequences around that as well. So the question which I'm going to be talking about is what are the political and social preconditions for achieving better environmental performance? Um, what kind of politics leads to um, a situation whereby we are better able to, to address and deal with um, the, 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 the very formidable challenges that we're facing? And how? Um, what do the countries which are, are, are achieving most success around this have in common? Um, there's lots and lots of ways we could be looking at this and lots and lots of factors. Um, in terms of political institutions, um, there's a very wide, there's a very wide um, literature on the effects political institutions have on significant societal change and on policy change and on political change. And there's a lovely paper published many years ago in relation to health reform in the United States, which simply is called, it's the institution stupid. So why doesn't America 
have a successful healthcare system, it's down to the institutions. I'm similarly thinking about this in a wider sense. Um, Ellen Immigat wrote a very famous book going back 20 years, which looked at the intersection of interests and institutions in Western Europe in relation to health and health politics, and came up with a number of um, uh, ideas, which I think have been hugely influential in the literature going beyond this. And um, more recently, we've seen claims from people like Wilkinson and Pickett, that more unequal societies often struggle to deal with societal challenge. In fact, there's a sort of almost vicious circle taking place that if you have a highly unequal societies, that's likely to lead to much less trust going through that society, less, much less ability to engage in democratic engagement, and, and as well as the consequences of inequality falling upon people harshly there in terms of their own lives and lifestyles. So if we put all of those things together, I think there's a case for beginning to think, well, maybe democracy has got something to do with this. Maybe the kind of political institutions we have might be important if we're going to successfully navigate the kind of changes that we need, as well as simply to get the widespread agreements that we'll need in place in order to actually make any kind of change actually happen. So there's something here about political institutions here, which I think is really, really important. Um, beyond that, there's something about inequality, which I think is important as well. But if inequality, if unequal societies have very low levels of trust and, and high levels of social ills or social harms within them, then is, 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 is the climate and is the environment likely to fall into that category as well? Are, are we going to really struggle in more unequal societies to try and actually achieve the social cohesion we need to actually make environmental change take place. Um, so I'm interested whether countries which are more successful in addressing climate change and in protecting their environment, of meeting environment targets, have political fact, particular political and social factors in common, which, which, which come from all of this sort of previous work. Um, so there's a range of key causal factors. And of course, I, 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 these, are, these are the ones that I've chosen. You could equally have chosen other ones as well. I fully accept that. Um, but I think we need a starting point. We need to begin to try and talk through this debate outside of the, uh, the technological and other factors which seem to be dominating it at the moment. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide because I wanna talk through each of these because they affect how you understand the data and the results. So it's important we get to grips with these a little bit. First of all, um, we don't talk as much about globalization as we used to. But what I think is really interesting is if you look back over the last 20 years, there are particular writers, and I think Giddens is a great example of this, who were uh, instrumental in raising the um, status and standing and understanding of globalization as a force which was going to be shaping all of our lives and leading to massive transformations. His book, Runaway World, which I've put the cover for of, is there. Of course, Giddens went on to widely write about climate change and the potential damages around this, explicitly thinking about it as a, a as as representing the major political challenge of our time. So I think globalization is important. Now, measuring globalization is, of course, extremely tough because it has so many different dimensions. There are cultural understandings of this, economic understandings of it, and, and, and everything in between. However, there are good indexes out there. I'm, I'm using the KOF index, the COF index in, within this, because I think it, it's, it brings together a whole range of factors, and I think, for me, it seems to have a great deal of validity in allowing us to begin to think about whether the more globalized nations that are out there are the ones which are dealing with, with climate change better or worse. And I think that's an open question to start with. I'm interested in both possibilities. Um, I've already talked about inequality. Um, again, um, inequality is hugely important because it, it, it's, it can be a proxy for the degree of societal trust, as well as, um, I, again, I've got the quote on there, we can either have democracy in this country or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both. Um, inequality is likely to lead to greater social ills. Inequality, I think, has been fairly clearly demonstrated in Wilkinson, Pickett and others to um, at least have uh, some relationship with a whole range of factors which are likely to mean that social cohesion is either absent or present in a country and that clearly we're going to need trust and cohesion if we're going to deal with climate change. Third point I've got is democratic participation. And I think this is really important. And this comes out a great deal in the work of Frank Hendricks, for example, which again, I put a screen up there and which will be important in terms of the index, which I'm using here. Um, are there particular forms of democratic structures and institutions which seem to be doing better around this? Um, now, this is a long debate that goes right through political science and I think is encapsulated in the work of Lippart, particularly, 
who has spent his whole career producing fairly complex understandings of how we can categorize democratic institutions. Um, some of those have, I think, survived quite well in terms of the test of time, others less so. Um, he produces two indexes in particular, one of which is around the extent to which either executives or political parties dominate than what goes on in a country. Another one which assesses the degree of federalism within a country. Um, the first index, the one around executives and parties, I think is very powerful. Um, Frank Hendricks has picked this up fairly recently with, with a colleague of his and produced a mapping of um, 80 electoral democracies, which I think is really interesting. They talk about something called integrative political structures versus aggregative political structures. Integrative ones are those which have a large number of of functioning political parties, often have more than one political party in government, as well as having more um, um, participative means of actually appointing people. Um, so when we think about proportionality in elections, for example, there are, that's often an idea of whether countries are more integrative, that is bringing lots of views into the political process, or perhaps more aggregative, that is once someone is appointed to government, they're able to more or less rule um, in, in a way which is largely independent of what's going on within the rest of the political debate. Um, it won't surprise you to hear that countries like the United Kingdom are much more aggregative than they are integrative. Um, but once we have a political party in power, and certainly they're twi twice in my lifetime that I can remember, we've had what we call a coalition government with more than one political party, but that remains the absolute exception. And we have a first past the post electoral system as well um, for the United Kingdom government which means that once a political party is in place, so long as it's able to whip its MPs, um, it is able to more or less have its will. Um, lastly, we've got level of tertiary education participation. Um, I've included that um, in this because environmental concern is often labelled as being something which um, people with um, higher degrees of tertiary education participation are likely to be most concerned about. So maybe it's the case then that if you have high levels of tertiary education, that people are more likely to regard this as a pressing issue within a country. Um, there may also be a case for saying this is something to do with um, scientific literacy as well. And so tertiary education is, again, an imperfect proxy around that, but at least it's a start to begin to think about whether it might be important. So we've got a range of different factors in here. Um, as well as these, of course, we need some way of actually measuring the result. Um, in terms of environmental performance, there are some really interesting indexes around this. I've used the uh, environmental um, performance index here um, because I think it, it's, I find it most persuasive in capturing um, the very different dimensions that go through this. It includes a range of environmental targets. It includes a whole range of um, different measures as well as to how um, ecosystem validity is being protected in different countries, um, as well as how environmental health is being protected more generally. And um, so that, that ends up producing an overall scorecard. And I found it fascinating going through this data to get some sort of sense of how these fit together, about which countries are, are perceived to be doing well, which countries are perceived to be doing badly. And I think it also is useful from the perspective of something like COP to begin to look at different countries in relation to their ranking on this. Um, so I found it really interesting to get a sense of um, where my own country, the United Kingdom, stands in relation to this, as well as getting a sense of, of what we might be good at, what we might be not so good at, um, and to begin to think about how, for example, recent changes we're seeing in the United Kingdom Parliament might reflect on this index and in future performance as well. Okay, so um, how do we, if you've got all of these things, then how are you going to make sense of them? Um, getting data is, is messy and complicated for them, as I've already said. But these are imperfect measures. I fully accept that. Um, I think you also then have to make sure that the countries you include are actually comparable. And one of my personal frustrations is when you have um, some sort of statistical analysis of 100 different countries and you look down the list and you think, well, why are you comparing them with them? They don't have anything in common. Um, so I wanted the countries within the sample to be comparable. Necessarily, you're limited by what data is available as well. Um, so you have to apply that additional lens. And so if you put all of this together, I think you end up with 23 developed OECD nations in producing, I think, consistent, clear data sets around this. What I've done with this um, is I've produced some cluster analysis to get an initial sense of who's like who, which I think is always interesting. So who, who is broadly comparable to each other in terms of the nations that are in this. 
And then I've used a method called qualitative comparative analysis in order to then try and match all of this data in line with the outcome. Now, all this does is effectively applies a particular form of, um, of, of algebraic reduction, which I can explain as we go through, to look for countries in terms of what they have in common and whether they're high or low performers. So that's really all you need to think about. This is not standard multivariate regression, which I don't think works in these circumstances. It's, it's a very different kind of method. It's been pioneered initially by um, an American sociologist, stroke political scientist called Charles Reagan, um, but it's been extended into a whole range of other areas over the last 20 years. Um, so that's the method which I'm going to apply. Um, it's good to start with the initial rankings. So which are those, which are the strong environmental performing countries according to the EPI? Well, if we look down the list, and I appreciate this might be a bit small, Denmark comes out top, followed by Luxembourg, Switzerland, the United Kingdom comes fourth. This is out of all the countries that are being measured in this. Now this is this is heartening. This is encouraging. Um, this this book this what I'm talking to you today is actually part of a, a wider book that I've I've just completed written finished writing. And this this is the only global challenge I've identified in which the United Kingdom is currently performing well in. So uh, we should take heart and be pleased about that. Um, looking down the list, we go to France, Austria, Finland, Sweden. I don't know if you can see the numbers next to this, but there's a score and an overall ranking. Then there's a regional ranking as well. And it's interesting that the top 11 countries, according to this index, are all within Europe. So they have regional rankings of 1 to 11, as well as an overall ranking of 1 to 11. Then we get Japan in 12th place, which is regionally ranked first before a continuation of Europe going down. Um, then we have other countries coming through. Um, now, one of the challenges, of course, is to try and work out within this list who we might regard as being the best performing. As clearly in the overall list, all of these countries are well performing. I think that's, however, somewhat missing the point, because as well as being the most highly performing nations, many of these countries are also amongst the most polluting. And so we need to be thinking very carefully about the impact these countries have as well. And we also have to have some sense of, of who you regard a country's peers as being, if you like. So who is like who in respect of all of these measures? And I think we have to be fairly hard in this respect. We have to be tough on countries because if we're going to get, if we are going to achieve some sort of environmental success, um, then, then we need to be aware that um, there, are, there are differences in the, in the measures. And my reading of this data is once you get much below an overall score of 77, actually there are often very significant things in the index which are highlighted as being really big shortfalls in the country's performance. So I've created a cutoff around there. That only includes the top 10 or 11 countries in the world as being high performing in relation to this. And I think that reflects the very significant challenges that we all face. And of course, it's also the case in a sample of 23, the top 11, 10 or 11 countries are half the sample. Um, and, and it would indicate that the countries falling outside of that group would have something to learn from that, from those top performing countries. Um, there are some other surprises in here. So New Zealand is only ranked 19th for some really interesting reasons. Italy is linked, linked down in the 20s. The United States of America is 24th. Um, there are clearly some countries which are not performing as well as others in relation to this index. OK, cluster analysis, first of all. Now, um, famously, Andrew Abbott, the sociologist, said that cluster analysis is a, is a really awful method which should not be used more or less by anybody at any time, but I've used it here anyway. So I wanted to get an initial sense of who's like who in the data. So I'm not regarding this as being as, as a clue, but I think it's interesting just putting the data down, who's like who. Um, one of the problems with cluster analysis is there's an almost an infinite number of ways you can do it. So here's two. Um, and, and I think the interesting bit is despite the differences in method, most of the countries turn out if you read from bottom up in terms of who their immediate peers are, as being pretty similar, actually. So who's the UK like on this basis? Well, the UK comes out as being broadly similar to France and Spain, in, according to the initial cluster analysis. Um, in terms of face validity, Austria turns out as being similar to Germany. Again, we might have expected that. Um, Norway, similar to Sweden, similar to Finland. Again, this seems to be working in terms of, uh, of having some, making some sort of broad overall sense. Um, and so looking down this, it seems to have an, some initial at least expectation of, where, of who we might have guessed would be like one another. There are some more surprising pairings. So Italy turns out as being most similar to New Zealand and the USA in, these, in terms of these indexes, which is quite peculiar. Um, um, but again, I think this is a starting point for beginning to think about the data and who's like who, if you like. Um, next stage in terms of this sort of analysis, 
is to move on to think about whether there are what's called necessary conditions for qualitative comparative analysis. A necessary condition is something which has to be in place in order to achieve the outcome. Technically, what you do is you look at the outcome, which is here, strong environmental performance. You say to yourself, OK, who's got these causal factors in common and what are they? Um, first of all, high globalization turns out to be a necessary condition. It's not absolutely perfect, but it is 0.883 consistent. What does that mean? Well, that's a score out of one. So the nearer you get to one, the more consistent that finding is. And it also has a very high relevance score because it's quite possible that there is no variation in this data. What this, this measure is telling us, there is actually variation. So we should treat this, treat this as being serious. Secondly, the combination of highly integrated government and low income inequality is also very consistent amongst the high environmentally performing countries. Uh, and the relevance score is a little bit lower, but certainly the consistency score is pretty high again. So it seems, well, what this seems to be suggesting is the countries with these factors in place, not, and this is an or rather than an and, um, seem to be most successful in terms of their environmental performance. So that's an initial index. Now, necessary conditions are good, but what we really want is sufficient conditions, which I'm going to come to in a minute. Sufficient condition is, given the causal factor, the outcome always occurs, whereas it's quite possible for a necessary condition for there to be other ways of achieving it. Um, next stage, technically, in QCA is to produce what's called a truth table. I'm not going to dwell for hours on this. But what it does is it produces the clustering, which we had um, through, the, uh, through the cluster analysis through a slightly different way of dealing with that, as well as giving you a broad indication of how consistent those clusters are with the solution outcome, as well as then giving you some broad sense of what the data might be saying in outline. This is also a useful stage of the analysis in terms of checking the validity of the data. But I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. So what I want to do is talk about the results which you get. OK, so. Broadly, there are three pathways in the data to achieving strong environmental performance. The, the solution is consistent to a degree of 0.873, so nearly up at 0.9, and it covers 0.76, so about three quarters of the countries which, have, um, which achieve high environmental outcomes. Um, first pathway includes the United Kingdom. So it's clearly something which is interesting. That is a pathway which is low integrated government, high tertiary education, and high globalization. The key point is here, this is the lowest in terms of consistency, that despite the fact that, that these factors seem to combine, not all of the countries actually achieve high environmental performance in this group. And I'm going to talk more about what that might mean in a minute. The second pathway is high integrated government, low tertiary education, high globalization and low income inequality. That's Finland, Austria and Germany. Consistency on that pathway it's got, only got three countries in it, that was extremely high, as it, um, um, and, and that would seem to indicate then that this is a pretty powerful combination of factors, both theoretically and empirically, in explaining environmental performance, especially very high environmental performance. The last pathway is high integrated government, high participation by the public, um, high globalization and low income inequality. Now that's very similar to the previous pathway but it includes a wider range of countries. So that's Austria, Germany, Belgium, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland. Now, clearly there's some overlap with the previous pathway there, because both Austria and Germany are in it as well. But so this is a different way of specifying those causal factors. This is something that comes out in qualitative comparative analysis, that there's more than one route of doing one route to the outcome that you're interested in. But as well as that, there's more than one way of understanding the particular combinations of factors. We're dealing with complex causality here. So what does all of this mean? Well, there's three pathways, as I've said. Um, the first is lower integrated government, high tertiary education, low globalization. But of the countries which have that combination, two of them have, if, in theory, the right causal factors, but are not amongst the most high in environmental performers. Now, Ireland and Canada are what are called deviant cases there. This pathway has the lowest consistency measure of the three. And I think then we have to regard this as being a pattern of factors in which countries succeed despite the factors they have in place rather than because of them. So these countries don't do achieve this, but not at a very high consistency level. The second combination is high integrated government, low tertiary education participation, high globalization, low income inequality, 
is Finland, Austria, and Germany. This pathway is the strongest in terms of consistency, but it's also the most narrow. So if you were specifying this from scratch, then these countries are very consistent, but of course this is only three countries. So this may be more limiting in terms of a template, thinking about what we might want to do. Lastly, we've got higher integrated government, higher democratic participation, higher globalization, low income inequality. That includes a wider range of countries with pretty high consistency, but there is one country here which falls short of high environmental performance and that's Belgium. Um, so this isn't entirely consistent with, with the countries that are in that set. Now that's a lot to take in. The key thing for me is that the second and third pathways are empirically and I think theoretically the most powerful. They cover the most of the high performing countries, they think closest to existing research. And I think that's important. Now there are finally two countries that are not in the solution but do perform well in terms of the EPI. Those are Australia and, and, and Japan. Japan, as we've seen, is a regional leader. So despite being low in terms of a European country ranking, it's highest in terms of its own region. Australia is a more challenging case because one thing I've discovered from writing now two books which do comparative analysis is if you're going to end up with a deviant case, it's Australia. Trust me on this. They seem to achieve very remarkable things despite, despite um, what, they, what, what, what their factors are are in place. Australia is the exception. Almost in every case I can tell you that I've measured across a whole variety of things, you have to say except Australia. It's also, I think, the case that this data was measured mostly on 2018, 2019 actual data. And since then, of course, Australia has had a number of challenges. Whether it remains in its position in the next production of this index will be another question, another point. Um, I was actually in Australia in December 2019, watching the bushfires in the distance and watching the environmental devastation they were causing. I think it's fair to say that um, Australia may be falling down these tables in, in future versions of it. Now, uh, for those of you that like a graph, here are the countries which are most high performing. Again, this may involve a bit of squinting and for that I apologize. Um, what we're looking for here is more or less countries that fall into this top right segment. That is that they fall highly into both the environmental solution and in terms of having high environmental performance. And technically, if they fall fairly close to this 45 degree line, they're doing pretty well. This also shows us the DV in cases. So we've got Ireland, Belgium and Canada down here as not fitting within this and, and gives us some sort of sense of how all of this, this, this fits in together. We've got Britain up here at the top right. Um, as achieving a very high environmental solution, um, as well as set membership of the high environment. However, as I've said, other countries with the same factors do not seem to be as successful as the United Kingdom. And that perhaps might be something of a warning shot to us. Okay, so key factors then. Key factors which are in common across solutions two or three. Are highly integrated government, low income inequality, high globalization. Um, those are also the necessary conditions we identified earlier. So that seems to have worked out pretty well. Um, solution three also adds tertiary education, higher democratic participation into this, but there's a disagreement about tertiary education between the, the second and third solution pathways. So I think it's fair to say that that, that remains fairly ambiguous. Um, as I said earlier, there is another solution pathway, but um, I worry fitting in, with us fitting into that pathway when other countries are falling short. Quite so, quite so far as they are. Um, it's also the case that of the three necessary conditions, the United Kingdom has only one of them, high globalization. And there's no obvious reason why um, without the possession of these other things that you would deal with high globalization particularly well. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that might mean in the next slide. So what does all this mean? Well, if you were designing a country from scratch based upon this data and you wanted it to be performing well in terms of the environment, what you would want is government and electoral systems which incorporate a wide range of interests rather than being dominated by a single political party and especially where that single political party were upon being um, elected often through a first past the post system effectively be able to dominate the executive of that country. Now there of course there are good reasons for suggesting that the opposite could be true that if you had a first past the post system and an executive dominating country and um, that country would be free to be able to put in place quite radical environmental protection. You might argue that, that that maybe is maybe what the UK has been in the past in terms of its positioning here. However, the opposite seems to be the case for many other nations and it certainly to be, seems to be a threat that unless you are incorporating a wide range of interests, uh, that acting in an unchecked way could be a significant problem. 
Um, were I being um, depressing to you at the moment, I would point to our own government's performance in recent weeks around this, of being faced with difficult decisions around the environment and maybe being inclined not to be coming to the right decisions. It's also, of course, the case that I'm speaking to you from Scotland, and Scotland does not have that same electoral system. However, Scotland is not an independent nation, as I, as I, as I say this. Maybe you'll be watching in, in future years through the video where that may no longer be the case. Um, and Scotland, however, does have a much different approach to government and one which is much more aligned with the recommendations that I'm suggest, sort of suggesting here. A second precondition might be lower levels of inequality. And this is where I'm afraid the United Kingdom also falls down, that the United Kingdom is a high inequality nation. That, I think, across the, the, across the piece here, looking at the countries, is a barrier to achieving successful mobilization in order to achieve greater environmental protection. Um, if we need high levels of trust, if we need high levels of social cohesion, it's going to be difficult to push against those factors. Now, it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means it's going to be a whole lot harder. And I think, again, looking across these countries and the spotty performance of countries with higher levels of inequality would, again, seem to back that up. Globalization, I think, is a really interesting point because I was genuinely, um, uh, I didn't know which way to call this, but it would seem that higher levels of globalization are, in fact, consistent with higher environmental performance. This is very much what Giddens' hope was 25 years ago that as a result of greater globalization, we'll be more aware of the effects we are having on other nations, that we would be able to hold our politicians to greater account, that the internet was going to be a great force for good in which we were able to engage in societal debate. Now, I suppose nobody can be completely right, can they? Um, but certainly some of those factors seem to be feeding in here. But I think the key point is, it's not so much globalization, it's, it's your response to globalization. What the countries here seem to have in common is that they are balancing its effects through greater integrated government, through incorporating other interests, rather than regarding globalization as in inevitably a force for actually achieving greater inequality. Um, this is the debate of flex security versus flex exploitation, if you like, in the labor market that it is possible to regard globalization as a force, which means that um, wages are driven down, that skill levels are driven down in order for you to compete on cost. But Many of the nations here have not done that to the same extent as the United Kingdom. There were choices here. Kathleen Thielen's very wonderful work looking at um, the labor market in different countries, I think, highlights this, that you can respond to globalization in different kinds of ways. A particular path we've gone down may not be the most constructive, both in terms of its immediate effect upon people, but also in terms of our ability to achieve a social coherence that we're going to need to deal with the environmental challenge that we face going forward. So um, I think there are both theoretical empirical reasons for looking at the key political and social factors which enable countries for performing better in relation to the environment. The three key factors are highly integrated governments, so countries that incorporate a wide variety of interests that use um, that use proportional electoral systems rather than first past the post ones and have more typically more than one political party in power at any moment in time rather than having it being dominated by an executive. Um, the UK does appear in the solution term for better environmental performance, but the least solution, the least consistent solution pathway. And I think that gives us clear pause for thought if we're going to be dealing with the challenge that lies before us. Of course, there was a referendum on this not that long ago in the United Kingdom about proportionality. Um, we seem very wedded in the UK to a first past the post system on the ground that it uh, allows government to act in a, in a coherent and um, possibly um, unchecked way in order to meet challenges and to put in place quick social change. Now that may be the case, but it does seem to be the case also that countries with far more integrated politics do seem to be doing this at least as well as us, and that should give us pause for thought. High levels of globalization do not have to lead to a fractured society and greater levels of inequality. Um, there is an alternative in the response, and I think the countries which are most successful in dealing with the environment do seem to be achieving that. Lastly, I think it's important to consider these factors as having complex patterns of interaction. These aren't single variables, they, they work with one another. There are several possible paths to high environmental performance. And looking across the piece to see how those work, I think is, is useful. And that's one of the reasons that I chose the method that I did for thinking about this. Um, lastly, whilst I've got your attention, I'm gonna plug the book to you. This is 
the book that we, this is the chapter from which will be out next year, Welfare States in the 21st Century, the New Five Giants. One of the new five giants I've identified is environmental degradation. That seems to fit very nicely into the, the timing of this event around COP26, and I think around what social um, um, science can contribute to an understanding around environmental change.